station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station, Luca on two. I'm ready for the event. Okay, Euronews. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Isabel Kumar from Euronews. Uh, can you hear me? Good morning, Isabel. I, I hear you loud and clear. How do you hear me? I hear you very well. This is great. So I think we'll start in a few seconds from now. Just to tell you about the format, uh, the interview itself will be 10 minutes long. Then we have some extra questions after. In the iTalk interview, we have video questions that we've received from our viewers, which will come in three different languages, but I will paraphrase those straight after. Is that okay? It is great. Sounds uh, like it's going to be fun. Can you hear me? Okay? Can you see me okay? I can see you, and I'm very jealous. It looks amazing. So I think I let's get going. I will explain what's all be, uh, around me and behind me uh, during the interview. Fantastic. Yeah, if, you, if you've got anything, yeah, you can show us, and we're going to talk about gravity at one point, so if you can show us something that will make it very visually uh, kind of clear to our viewers what, what you're explaining, that's great. But, okay, we're going. We're going to start now. The next Space then set balance of automatics, you know what? sensation making history hundreds of kilometers above our heads Luca Parmitano is the youngest astronaut on a long-term mission to the International Space Station the 36 year old Italian blasted up to the ISSS just a few weeks ago and joins us live from the orbiting outpost answering your questions and sharing a rare glimpse of what life is like in space Luca many thanks for joining us on iTalk I'd like to know what's impressed you the most up there Well, it'd be easier to answer what has impressed me the least, um, because everything has impressed me. Uh, living aboard the station is a very sensorial experience. Everything here is uh, perceived differently. Um, the things that we are used to uh, take for granted uh, don't apply here anymore. And so uh, every time I, I look around, is a, is a surprise, is a different, uh, a different sensation. But. Um, I, I, I think I'm surprised. Uh, as in, it, what's impressed me is how um, technology in the space station is really um, uh, part of our daily life, and, but we adapt so fast that now it just feels like home, even though we are surrounded by, uh, by technology and a very thin, uh, very thin wall between us and space. Okay, well, we'll go straight to our first question, and that comes from Belgium. Hello, my name is Kelly from Belgium, and I want to know what has been the most difficult thing for you to get used to in space. So there's been months of preparation, but what took you by surprise when you were up there? Well, I have to say that uh, um, the training that we get on the ground really does an amazing job of getting us uh, ready uh, for uh, for living up in space on the space station. The environment looks oddly familiar after spending years, literally two and a half years, in different buildings around the world that that where we have uh, mock-ups of the station uh, of of this module where I'm living right where I'm uh, where I am right now. So uh, we are we are actually very uh, they, it looks very familiar once you get here because you've seen it so many times. Uh, I actually 
uh, was surprised. Um, uh, the, the thing that was really hard for me, however, was getting used to how things work different in, different in uh, zero G. Uh, what what is easy on the ground, like staying still, is almost impossible uh, on at zero G. You things float all the time. It's impossible to put something somewhere. You always have to tether it or attach it through Velcro or other means. So it's the, um, this reverse way of thinking where. Uh, things that are easy on the ground are hard on space and vice versa. That was the most hard, the hardest thing so far to adjust to. Very briefly now, but how long did it take you to adjust to that? I, I think I'm constantly adjusting to it. Uh, it's it's a, it's an evolving process. I've been on the station almost three weeks now, and I, I feel comfortable enough. I think that um, a, um, a two-week span is what it really takes to start feeling completely confident about uh, moving in, three, in, in a three-dimensional world and uh, um, getting used to, uh, to, to, to the microgravity environment. Okay. Well, Luca, we're going to go to our next question now. Bonjour, je suis Grégory, je suis belge et j'aimerais bien savoir euh, votre quotidien dans l'espace. So you have got a very busy schedule up there. You're carrying out a lot of experiments. Can you briefly give us an outline of what you're doing? So on the space station at any given moment, we have hundreds literally of experiments. But um, we, we are only involved in, uh, in a few of them at the same time. For example, uh, today um, uh, my schedule is uh, part, partly busy with the ATV, uh, uh, the European uh, Space Agency spacecraft that just arrived a couple of days ago, uh, actually yesterday. Uh, we are busy with um, some preparation, opening the hatch, which I just finished. As far as experiment, I am uh, currently doing um, a diet experiment where uh, we are trying to figure out, the scientists are trying to figure out how to reduce the loss of calcium. And my colleagues, I'm glad you asked this question because I have right here an example of what, of what science we were doing today. Uh, this is an ultrasound machine right behind me. And today, my, my, two, my two colleagues, Chris, Chris Cassidy and uh, Karen Nyberg, were actually uh, uh, analyzing each other's spine through an ultrasound machine. And this will be a, re a revolutionary way for people on the ground be able to analyze damages to their spine uh, in remote areas where MRIs or X-ray machines are not available. This is going to be a very big impact on the ground as we speak. And there are some health issues up in space for you personally. Again, we're very short of time, but quickly, tell us what those are. Uh, you're going to have to ask the question again. I, I missed the first part. There are some health issues for you personally up in space. As again, we're very short of time, but can you quickly tell us what those are? Sure. Um, so uh, one of the issues is the loss of calcium. Our bones need gravity to uh, to to grow and get strong in a very simple way. Uh, if they're not, they don't experience that the gravity, they, they do not, they, they tend to lose their, their, their calcium and to become brittle and fragile. It's all, sort of like osteoporosis. Another issue is uh, at a cardiovascular level, you, your, your uh, muscles tend to atrophy because you don't use them as much. I don't use my legs almost, almost at all while moving around in space. And the third one is related to, uh, to, uh, to vision. Uh, because, of, uh, um, because of the zero-G environment, uh, eyes tend to change, to, uh, change shape. That will affect long-term vision, even permanently. Okay, Luca, we're now going to have a question from one of your biggest fans, and that's five-year-old Alessandro. Ciao, Luca, mi chiamo Alessandro. Ma mia domanda è, pensi che esistano altri pianeti abitati nello spazio? Grazie, ciao! 
So, um, with the Kepler telescope, he, he's spot on, isn't he, Alessandro? Sounds amazing. Yeah, he sounds like a great kid. So, so here's my uh, the question: Is are there uh, are there other forms of, of life on uh, on other planets, according to me? So, uh, if you're ready for my answer, uh, that would be uh, the, the, my answer would be this. And this is Lucas speaking, not not the astronaut, uh, just just a simple person. I believe that there are so many planets. Uh, millions and millions of planets in the universe that what we lack right now is imagination. If we, if we could only imagine something different than what we call life, maybe not based on, on water, not based on, 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 the, on oxygen, but on something completely different, maybe methane, maybe uh, a, a, you know, diff a different form of something comparable to what we call life, then I think that, the, that it, we're talking more of a probability than a possibility. And, and that's the simplest way I can put it. Luca Pamitano, many thanks for joining us on iTalk. We now have got a few more questions from other programs. And um, one of those is for our Learning World program. It's on education. And we want to know what was the most important milestone in terms of learning that changed the course of your life? Oh, that, is a, that is a great question. Uh, if I had to pick one moment that uh, really changed my life, was when I was about 16 years old and I became an exchange student. I, uh, I won a scholarship, go live for a year by myself in the, in the U.S. as an exchange student. And I think that coming from, from Sicily, which is uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, it's in the south of Italy, uh, a little bit far away from, from the heart of Europe, uh, that experience really opened my eyes and uh, uh, introduced me to the beauty of difference, uh, the, the beauty of something that is culturally completely uh, unrelated to what you're used to, and not to be afraid of, of, of social and cultural differences. Okay, then I've got some questions from your colleagues. Uh, with the arrival of the automated transfer vehicle, you'll soon work on an experiment called Phases. What can you tell us about this experiment? So Phases is a, an experiment that is related to emulsions. Um, the, uh, emulsions are important because they, they have applications in many different fields, from, from pure chemistry to uh, chemical industry to um, even, even the food industry. And as an Italian, that's specifically important. Um, uh, emotions have a tendency to be stable or unstable, and sometimes we want them stable, sometimes we want them unstable. On the space station, we have the unique opportunity to study them in an environment where uh, the, this, uh, their characteristics are not affected by gravity, and so it's an ideal uh, place to study them in its simplest form. So how can we benefit from this experiment? Well, let's, um, let's imagine a, a, a fuel. A fuel is, a, is basically uh, a, um, a mix of different, uh, different uh, chemicals. Now, obviously, we will want this chemical to be stable for the longest possible, so that it can be stored, it can be used later uh, in, in any condition, on the ground, in storage, on, uh, on, on space, because of, of lack of, of, uh, of acceleration of gravity. So, uh, we, if we need this fuel to be stable, we need to understand what are the characteristics that make a fuel stable or unstable. Um, so, that, so that we can exploit those characteristics and accentuate the one that we like eliminate the ones that we don't like. The same goes for, for storage of food, for example. Uh, a simple thing like, uh, like a vinaigrette. Um, you know, you, you, everybody has seen uh, these uh, this bottles of mixes that uh, separate after a, a while. Well, we need to, um, it would be great if we could uh, have, find a simple way um, to, to uh, study 
uh, these liquids so that they stay in a certain form, in a stable form, uh, for the longest time. The, tr the, the same is, is true for the opposite. Sometimes we would like things to separate easily so that we can distinguish them. And uh, that, again, the applications on the ground can, can vary from, uh, from, from storage to um, a simpler way of separating, of cleaning. Uh, there's just certainly, certainly many more applications that I cannot think of right now. Uh, but uh, those are just a few examples that I could give. Okay, so you're participating in an experiment in September with Michelle Hopkins called Energy. Uh, can you tell us briefly about that experiment? Certainly, and it's sort of related to the one that I was talking about, the diet. Um, in the future, we will, uh, we will try to understand how we can uh, go further in space, uh, leave low Earth orbit and, uh, and be independent. Well, in order to do that, we need to understand how much food, how much energy we spend as individuals when we are on orbit. So this experiment that, that, we, are, that we will do in September uh, is going to determine exactly when it, when a degree of precision that has never been attained before, exactly how much energy does a, um, an average astronaut cosmonaut use uh, while in space. And that way we can, we can predict the future, how much fuel for the body, how much food, how much water we're going to need to store in the spaceship to, uh, in order to go uh, for, a, for a trip, who, who knows, maybe to the next planet. Okay, yeah, I think we have no more time, or maybe we could just quickly try and slip something in now. Uh, can you explain what you drink? No? Okay, sorry, we're done. Station, we're out of time. This is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. And thank you very much to your news. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Yes. In this time, this is uh, Luke on Space to Round 2. Copy.